The book of Acts, which we've been journeying through the last few sessions, isn't just about superstar preachers. Uh, you would almost think to hear some people talk about the Bible that uh, it's kind of the same as today. You've got all these spectators that come to church and there's a few religious professionals that they get paid to be very highly spiritual and very highly engaged and very highly enthused. But that's not what Acts is about. Uh, not at all. And, and you have to make up your mind. We have to make up our minds. I have to make up my mind whether I want to be just a 21st century distant copy or distant relative of the first century church or whether I actually want to do what Jesus said, I will build my church. And the book of Acts is that blueprint. So the book of Acts is largely about ordinary Christians, if there is such a thing. Uh, they're not the paid professionals. There were no paid professionals. Uh, they're not the leaders uh, these are ordinary Christians who just will not stop witnessing about what Jesus Christ has done everywhere they go. And so over the last couple sessions, we talked about Acts 6 where they appointed deacons. Deacons doesn't mean a church position. The word is diakonos. It means a servant. And so they appointed people to serve the church. But when you serve the church, you're automatically a witness. You're automatically on deck to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so out of the seven, we next read about a couple of examples. Stephen in Acts chapter 7, uh, he preaches a sermon that, that literally convicts the entire Jewish council. He is martyred, but that results in persecution that spreads the gospel everywhere because the church has to leave Jerusalem. So even in defeat, God has his will, his purpose, and his kingdom uh, just occur the way he wants it to. Then in Acts 8, we read about Philip. And the, the big verse to me about Philip is this one. And uh, you'll remember this. The Bible says when Philip uh, met the Ethiopian eunuch and he began to talk to him, the Bible simply says, Philip opened his mouth and he began at the same scripture where the guy was reading in the Bible. He didn't know anything about Jesus. He didn't know anything about the New Testament church. Certainly didn't know anything about baptism or the Holy Ghost. But Philip opened his mouth. He began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And if you want to do what God's will is for you in your little one and only solitary life, here's the will of God for you. Open your mouth, start where they are, and share with them Jesus. Open your mouth. That's step one. Uh, Christianity is not just about showing up at church and watching. That's not Christianity at all. That's some weird religious hybrid that we've come up with in the 21st century. Christianity always has been about open your mouth, start where they are, and just keep preaching to them Jesus. Talk about his goodness. Talk about his church. Talk about salvation. Talk about a miracle that you've seen. Talk about something that happened to you. Talk about what God has been telling you in prayer. Talk about anything. Just talk about Jesus. Open your mouth, begin where they are, and share Jesus. I wish somebody would give me an amen to start with. And that's all the church in Acts did, and that's all we're supposed to do. In Acts 9, uh, last uh, time we read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes widely known as Paul the Apostle. But Paul wouldn't have experienced salvation at all if it hadn't been for Ananias. And he wouldn't have even been accepted by the New Testament church if it hadn't been for Barnabas. Here's the scriptures, Acts 9, 17. Ananias went his way, entered into the house, put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, he sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ananias isn't a preacher. Ananias isn't a leader. Ananias isn't on church salary. Ananias has never stood in a pulpit because they didn't even have pulpits back then. Ananias is a Christian who's not afraid to open his mouth, start where they are, and preach to them Jesus. And there wouldn't be an Apostle Paul if there hadn't been an unknown Christian, an obscure Christian named Ananias. And then Paul receives his experience, and uh, the Bible tells us, we talked about it last time, he goes out into the wilderness of Arabia, and he's alone by himself, and God teaches him so much. But then he comes thinking, well, now I'm ready. God's prepared me. I'm going to go link forces with the church, and uh, we're going to do ministry together. We're going to preach the gospel together, and the church is going to have nothing to do with him. Because Saul was the one that arrested the Christians. 
He was the one that persecuted the church. He was the one that had put thousands of them to death, and so they weren't all that anxious. But there was a man named Barnabas. Acts 9, 27, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. He vouched for his testimony that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. There wouldn't be an Apostle Paul if it hadn't been for an obscure Christian named Ananias and another obscure Christian who essentially disappears in just a few chapters named Barnabas. Now that's the will of God for us. You don't have to be a big shot. One of our problems in the 21st century is that everybody, if they're going to be enthused about church, they've got to be in charge of the church. If they're going to be enthused about God, they've got to be the one that everybody's listening to their talking head all the time. And that's not the New Testament pattern. The New Testament pattern is side to side, front to back, everybody, one and all. We just all open our mouth, start where they are, and preach to them Jesus. That's the will of God. Now, Paul essentially, when he becomes converted, he becomes pretty much the main character for the remainder of the book of Acts. Um, That's an illustration. There's all kinds of apostles going everywhere preaching the gospel. But Paul basically becomes the the storyline for the rest of the book of Acts. And the reason is that Luke writes Acts, and he's actually writing evidence for Paul's trial later when he gets arrested. And that's why this happens. It's not because Paul's a superstar. It's not because he's a rock star. It's not because everybody's fawning over Paul. Everybody is doing the kinds of things he's doing. But because Luke is writing his story, that's why he becomes the main character. But just before we head into Paul's ministry, we first revisit the ongoing ministry, and that's where we are today, uh, the ongoing ministry of another apostle named Peter for a brief moment. He's not as prominent as Paul in this particular book, But you'll notice that it's Peter's ministry that every time we transition in the book of Acts, Peter appears. Because Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven in Acts chapter 2. He used them. That's to open the door to the Jews. And then in Acts chapter 8, they called him. He went to Samaria. He used them again. That's to open the door of salvation to the Samaritans. And then in Acts chapter 10, which we're heading for this morning, he goes again. God sends him, and he opens the door of salvation to the last people group, which encompasses everything else. The the Jews are the Jewish people. The Samaritans are kind of a a half-breed people. They're Jews that have backslidden and intermarried through all the nations around them and come back to to Israel. And so that's the next people group. And the final people group's the big one. That's all the rest of us, the Gentiles. And every time God shifts gears in the New Testament church, they go and get Peter. Peter appears because Peter had received the keys. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the keys. And so Peter uses those same keys. There's not a different salvation plan for Canadians and Americans and Chinese. There's not a different plan. It's the same plan that works for everybody. Furthermore, there's not a different salvation plan for every Christian denomination. There's not 10 plans or 100 plans. It's one plan. It's in the Bible. Peter always appears to make sure, uh, sent by God to make sure that they're using the right keys. Acts chapter 9, here we go, verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelled at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed. He'd been crippled for eight years, and he was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately, and all that dwell at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. The apostle Peter, he's preaching. He's engaged in an itinerant ministry that's taken him to Lydda. Lydda's a, a largely Gentile city. It's about 25 miles from Jerusalem. That's nothing today, but it was a significant little journey in that day. The area had been evangelized by disciples, not by Peter. The disciples had already fled here from Jerusalem. Many unknown Christians will never know their name until heaven. They had already been here. They'd already shared the gospel. They'd already preached. And now Peter joins them. Acts 8, 25 says he preached in many villages. And Philip the evangelist that we read about in Acts 8, he's in the same area. And Acts 8, 40 says he was preaching in all the cities. So Peter and Philip, what they've done is they've just joined the Christians in this particular area of the country and God's working with them and God's working 
working miracles through their hands. I, I'd like to, to look at one word there that just kind of I, I'm prompted this morning. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Anytime you see ETH in the King James Version, it means a continuing action. Jesus didn't just heal that man so he could get up, but that man had a lot of baggage, no doubt, from being in that state for that many years. But Peter said, Jesus isn't just going to make you whole with a miracle today and then drop you. He maketh thee whole. He's going to make you whole. And if you'll hang on to this, and if you'll pray through this, and if you'll stick with this, and if you'll believe on this, God will continue his work. Verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works, alms deeds, which she did. So this is a good lady. She, she's very involved in her community. She's very involved in, in doing all kinds of good deeds. It came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. So they prepare her body for burial. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa. So they know that Peter's at Joppa preaching. And Lydda is pretty close to Joppa. And uh, so since it was near, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men. They desired that he would not delay to come to them. Don't, don't delay. We need you. This is an emergency. Then Peter arose and went with them. Now, nobody in the disciples yet has raised the dead. Nobody. It hasn't happened yet. But Jesus raised the dead. And in the book of Acts, they believe something that you either believe or you don't believe. And that's that when Jesus' spirit is in his church, anything that Jesus did, any miracle that Jesus performed, anything that Jesus saw, his church is capable of seeing. I don't think in the 21st century a whole lot of so-called Christians believe that. But in the first century, no disciple has yet raised the dead. There's no precedent. There's no pattern. Peter and Paul, none of them have raised the dead at this point. And yet... These people believe enough that Jesus gave the keys to his disciples, that Jesus gave power to his disciples, that Jesus' spirit is working in his disciples, that they actually call for a human being just like you and me to come because somebody has died. Peter rose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. All the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. They're having a funeral. They've got the pictures out. They've got the garments out. They're saying, you know, she was a good lady. Here's what she did, and here's how she ministered. And Peter put them all out of the room, and he kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Same words that Jesus used over a little girl almost. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. He didn't run out of the room screaming. He gave her his hand, he lifted her up, and he called all the saints and widows and presented her alive. Here she is. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Peter was expecting something to happen when he prayed. Jesus told us, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if you believe that much, it'll be done unto you. Peter obviously believed that much. It was known throughout all Joppa. Many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a Tanner. So that's where he's staying. He's lodging with this other guy named Simon the Tanner. And Peter's in Joppa for a reason. If you read in the Old Testament, there's a book that's about the city of Joppa. Uh, Jonah, the prophet in the Old Testament. Jonah went to Joppa to avoid going to preach to the Gentiles. Peter goes to Joppa, and it's there that he receives his call to preach to the Gentiles. It's a new day. Because Jonah disobeyed God, God sent a storm that caused all the Gentile sailors that were in that boat to fear, and they cast him overboard. But because Peter obeyed the Lord, God sent a wind, a different kind of wind. It was the wind of the Spirit that caused the Gentiles not to fear but to rejoice. God has set Peter up to be in the right place at the right time so he can do God's will. And you may 
may believe it or you may not believe it, but it's true nonetheless. You'll just be blissfully unaware and you bounce through your life and your life doesn't count. Or you can see it this way. God puts you strategically in the right place at the right time with the right people so you can open your mouth and start where they are and preach to them Jesus. You either get that or you're totally oblivious to that. I said, you either get that or it sounds like you're totally oblivious to that. You're in the place where you are. You're with the people you're with. You're at the job you're at. You're in the school that you're in. You're in the neighborhood that you're in so you can open your mouth and start where they are and preach to them Jesus. You either get that or you don't. If you want to be some other kind of church, like every other kind of church that exists today, and it's just a social club, that you can do. That's easy to do uh, for a little while, and then people get fighting, and it all blows up, and blah, blah, blah. But if you really want to be a New Testament church, God didn't call you to sit on a pew once a week and that be the sum total of your religious experience. In fact, God didn't call you to have a religious experience at all. The Jews had a religious experience. What God called you to be is a container, a vessel filled with his spirit so that wherever you go, when you get that open door, it doesn't have to be wide open. They just have to open it a crack and you jump in and you open your mouth and you start where they are and you preach to them. Jesus, that's what's happening here. And so Peter's really on, in Joppa on, on divine assignment. That's, that's really where he is. Um, Jesus had said this in John 14. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, you either do or you don't, the works that I do he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. The power of God is still in the church today if we are the same church. Now, how do you know you're the same church? Because you believe the same message and you live the same way. I think we pride ourselves way too much on believing the same message to the exclusion of living the same way. I'm not campaigning to go back to first century technology or transportation. I'm not campaigning to go back to first century plumbing. Definitely not that. I'm not campaigning for any of that, but I am campaigning for this. I would like to not only be a church that knows the message of the apostles, but a church that subscribes to the method of the apostles. And the reason churches struggle so much is because what we try to do is throw some dollars in the collection plate so other people, we can pay them to do the work of the ministry. That's not anywhere in your Bible. In fact, what's really happening here is the Christians everywhere, on their jobs, everywhere, in their neighborhoods, with their families, with their friends, and even with their enemies. They just keep opening their mouth, starting where those people are, and preaching to them Jesus. They don't ever retire. They don't ever get too old that they don't do that. They don't ever get too much seniority in the church, so they don't have to do that anymore. It's just the pattern. We either are that or we're something different. It was always God's will, by the way, to have these pagan, rotten, filthy, sensual, sinful Gentiles in his church. And aren't you glad? Because <laughs> Paul said, such were some of you. The Jewish believers who were already saved didn't really want that to happen. Mm. There's nothing that fires me up any more than somebody giving off that attitude. They don't even have to say it. They just give off that attitude that this is our little church and what do they think they're doing in our little church? There's nothing that makes me any more frustrated than that. This is not my church. This is not your church. This is not his church or her church or their church or our church. This is God's church. We just happen to pay the utilities on a building that we built so that we have a place that when it's, uh, you know, the weather's inclement, that we can come and we can be together. But we can be the church if the building burns down. We can still be the church if somebody repossesses the building. In fact, sometimes I wonder if, some, if it wouldn't be better for us if God sent us a little bit of grief every once in a while. Because we get so comfortable we get so comfortable. And God's will is not for us to show up and 
we haven't done anything by showing up here. We, we, we haven't even got to square one yet. That you came to church this week, that's a benefit to you. Not a benefit to God. It's a benefit to you that you got to come be with other believers and worship and fellowship together and give and sow into the kingdom. That's a blessing to you. That doesn't even begin. If that's all you're doing in your Christianity, you haven't even got anywhere close to the Bible yet. Because this is just a filling station where you come in and, and you get tanked up, ready to go do the real job of Christianity. Your real Christianity is not to have the biggest impact in this building. We've already seen you pray. We've already seen you worship. We already know that you're living for God. Done. Where your testimony is sorely, desperately needed is beyond the walls of the church building out in society where you open your mouth, start where they are, and preach to them, Jesus. Mm. Maybe these Jewish believers were so busy keeping their church clean that they didn't want to reach out to those that were different. But God did not mind, and he still does not mind, messing up their comfortable church to see souls saved, because he'll leave the 90 and 9 every time and go after the 1. There's an odd scripture in Proverbs that says, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Think about that for a minute and you'll get it. You don't have any barnyard animals, you can have a really nice, neat barn. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. You're not going to have any animals to do any of the work or produce any of the, the uh, uh, pro produce of a farm if you don't have animals. So you choose between productivity and mess. You, you have to have both or you don't get either. And it's the same in the 21st century church. If you want a nice little clean church where our accomplishment every week is coming to church, patting each other on the back, saying we know the truth and we're living for God, hallelujah to the Lamb. If that's what you want to do for church every week, you've totally missed the point. You might as well throw this out. That went over big. See, the further we get into the book of Acts, it just keeps nailing it over and over and over and over again. This is not anything like what everybody thinks it's supposed to be like in the 21st century. If you want pure first century church, you're going to have to do something different than corrupted, uh, traditional 21st century church. My goodness, I want God to invade us with a spirit that says we want to get back to the original. It's not enough to get back to the original doctrine. I love the original doctrine. Not going to move off the original doctrine because it's the only thing that works and changes lives. But you know what? I'm not content to just have the original doctrine. I want the original experience of the first century church. If there's anybody in this room that even there's a little glimmer of that in you, I wish you'd lift your, I think we need to stand for a minute because we just need to break the comfort zone. If you'd lift your hands and say, God, I really do, before I die, before the rapture, want to be part of a first century church in the 21st century. <laughs> Say, Pastor Raymond, isn't there something else we can preach? Well, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff we can preach, but this is the foundation of everything else. Everything else that we preach has to be built on this one or we don't get it. You can be seated. Without this, everything starts to frazzle and fracture. Everything starts to disintegrate. And we start seeing the same sins, the same addictions, the same problems, the same fighting, the same divisions in a church and in our families as we see in the world if we don't get this. Because see, a first century church member wasn't about showing up. 
A first century church member was about going forth. That's the big difference. Uh, Jesus, when he was on the earth, he said to his disciples, come and see. But as soon as they saw, then he started saying, go and tell, go and tell, go and tell. So that's the point. Um, It's 10 years after the day of Pentecost, 10 years, and they are just beginning now with this ministry that we just read about to the Samaritans. They're just starting to get out of their comfort zone. And if it hadn't been for divine intervention, it probably would have been another 10 years or more before they ever would go to the Gentiles. At least the Samaritans were half Jewish. Now, now it was in the Word of God forever, uh, way back in the book of Genesis. Um, And in thy seed, Abraham, God said, shall all the nations, not just the Jewish nation, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. God gave that promise to Father Abraham. This is the first book of the Torah. This has been around forever, and they missed it. Isaiah the prophet spoke, and he said, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles. That's a messianic scripture. The Messiah wasn't just for the Jews. He was a light to the Gentiles. One of their own prophets saw that. Isaiah also said in chapter 60 and verse 3, he said, the Gentiles shall come to thy, thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So going to the Gentiles wasn't because the Jewish church didn't work. It was because it had always been in the purpose of God to go to the Gentiles, to reach the Gentiles, to go to people that weren't like the status quo, to go to people who had a vastly different and inferior lifestyle to the Jewish people, and it was still God's will to go reach them, bring them in, and mess up everything in the church. Because God would sooner the church be messy than clean. He'd sooner the church have a whole bunch of people that don't have it all together and aren't perfect and haven't got all their problems conquered. And if that happens to be you, you're in a great place this morning. And it has nothing to do with whether the person beside you in the pew wants you here or not. If they do, they're in the will of God. If they don't, they got a major problem. But the point is, Jesus wants you here. Jesus wants you in his church. Jesus wants you to get delivered. Jesus wants to do something in your life. That's the point. The last prophet to speak in the Old Testament, Malachi, said, From the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name, God said, shall be great among the Gentiles. It's always God's will for the Gentiles to come in, but the Jews missed that. How in the world they missed it, I don't know. Pastor Jack preached something in Singapore when we were there, and it it, it just incredibly uh, blessed me. Acts chapter 10, we flip to the story. This is, this is ground zero for us. This is where we come into the church. We love Acts 1 through 9, but that's, we're not even there yet. We read about that, but that's what God was doing in the Jewish church. We wouldn't have been here today if it wasn't for Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He is actually a centurion over a band of soldiers from Italy, and he's here on duty in Judea, in Caesarea, and he's working for Rome. He is a devout man, and he's one that feared God with all his heart, which gave much alms to the people, and watch this, and he prayed to God always. He prayed to God always. So, and here's what Pastor Jack said that inspired me so much. While Jesus was speaking forth the promise of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 1, Cornelius was praying. You remember this? While the disciples were watching the Lord ascend back up into heaven, although they didn't know it, Cornelius was praying. While the 11 disciples had to have a draw lots and and they were choosing Matthias to take the place of Judas, Cornelius was still praying. While the believers waited in the upper room and while the Holy Ghost was falling and while people for the first time began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, he didn't know anything about that yet, but Cornelius was still praying. 
While Peter preached his sermon on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 were added to the church and baptized in Jesus' name on the first day of church history, Cornelius wasn't there, but Cornelius was praying. While the lame man leaped and danced and rejoiced his way into the temple, healed by the name of Jesus, Cornelius was still praying. And while the church council called Peter and John in, and they stood before them eyeball to eyeball and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. While Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost and fell dead on the ground. While the apostles were being persecuted and arrested and jailed and beaten, and it didn't even slow the church down one little bit. Cornelius didn't experience any of that, but Cornelius was praying. While the church gathered together, and the Bible says the place where they were gathered and assembled together was shaken as the Holy Ghost came upon them. Cornelius didn't get to be in that church service because he wasn't in the church yet, but he was praying. Seven deacons appointed, they begin to serve the church. Stephen is preaching his sermon, and he gets stoned for it. Simon the sorcerer is trying to purchase the power of God that he sees in Samaria. Philip the evangelist is baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch in the desert. Saul is being apprehended by Jesus on the Damascus road. Peter is praying, and Dorcas sits right up on her bed, and he introduces her back to the fellowship of her church. Cornelius didn't experience any of that, but But while all of that was going on, there was still a man who wasn't saved, wasn't a Jew, wasn't in the church, didn't know about baptism in Jesus' name, didn't know about the Holy Ghost, but every day he was praying. He prayed always. He gave everything he could to God. He was a good man, but he wasn't saved. He was a religious man, but he wasn't saved. He feared God, but he wasn't saved. He gave alms to the people, but he wasn't saved. He even prayed to God every day, but he wasn't saved. And there's somebody in your circle of friends and family and neighbors and colleagues that they're praying to God. You don't see it because you don't think that they match you. You don't think they're interested in what you have, but what you don't realize is while you're experiencing all of this over somewhere in a bedroom, over somewhere in a living room, driving in their car, they're praying, God, there's got to be more than this. And while we have service after service, service after service after service, God is putting that little discontent in your heart. Some of you, pastor's got to talk to you today. The reason your life is falling apart is because you're not living for God according to the scripture. The reason you're so upset and you're so frustrated and you're so discontent is you're not living for God according to the scripture. You've become some kind of denominational church member. You show up to church, but your entertainment choices don't reflect your relationship with God and your friends don't reflect your relationship with God and everything that you do during the week, it doesn't reflect your relationship with God. So of course you're discontent, and of course you're frustrated, and of course you're being pulled into, and of course your life is starting to unravel, and your home is starting to unravel. Of course it is, but if you could ever just see that God didn't put you here on this earth and leave you here to be normal, he put you here and left you here to be a witness so you could open your mouth and start where they are and preach to them, Jesus. You ever get involved in that? It's exciting to be involved in that. You ever get involved in that? You're going to want to live for God because you got people following you on the way to living for God. You ever get involved in that and it's all over for the devil because you've got a higher, greater, grander purpose in life. That's the New Testament pattern. And why? While you're in church this morning, maybe kind of bored and waiting for dismissal, somebody in your circle of friends is praying, God, send somebody. And that somebody is not Pastor Raymond who doesn't even know their name and has never met them. That somebody is you that sits at the next desk. That somebody is you that's in the same class. That somebody is you. Atoshe 
that's New Testament. That's the original. The original is not just a collection of doctrines that you can use in sermons or Bible studies to beat up on everybody else that doesn't get it. That's not the New Testament pattern. The New Testament pattern is a message and it's a method. It's not only what we believe, it's what we do. If your Christianity, if your Pentecostalism is only about what you believe, you've got it wrong. It has to be about what you believe and what you do. Jesus help me today. Verse 3, Cornelius saw a vision. God was so kind to him that he sent him a vision. You know why? Because he was praying. He wasn't saved yet, but he prayed. He wasn't saved yet, but he was a good man. He wasn't saved yet, but he was a very religious man. Thank God Cornelius had enough sense to know that just because he was a good man, he wasn't saved. Just because he was religious, he wasn't saved. Just because he did good deeds, he wasn't saved. There's a lot of people today that think because they're good and do good deeds and they're quite religious and they're a good person, and some of us have bought that lie that they're so good God would let them into heaven on a pass. God only lets people into heaven who've experienced Bible salvation the way God gave it to be preached and proclaimed and experienced. Thank God Cornelius didn't think he was going to get a pass. He saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms, all the good stuff that you've done, it doesn't save you. Wouldn't even come close. Because the Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. But here's what it did do. Your prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. God has watched you. And so God's going to intervene in a very particular way. Why do you think God put you in their life? It's because God is answering their prayer. You are the answer to somebody's prayer. The reason God put you in their space and in their face is because they've been praying. They, they don't even call it prayer. They just call it desperation. They maybe call it depression. They maybe call it, you know, the, the, the morning after a big drunk and they're feeling all terrible about life and themselves and, and they they just feel like garbage. That, they don't call it prayer, but it is prayer because in the middle of that stupor, they cry out to God and say, there's got to be something more. And somebody sitting in this building today, you are an answer to prayer. But if the answer to prayer decides to disconnect, then God loses the call. So God's got his hand on you. Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. So now send men to Joppa. Now this is, this is good. And call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner. His house is by the seaside. Watch this. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. See, God says, it's not enough for you to be religious. It's not enough for you to be a good person. It's not enough for you to have good deeds in your life. You need to send for somebody. You need to get to somebody. You need to interact and intersect with somebody that can tell you what to do. Because unless you get somebody that can tell you the New Testament message of salvation, you can be ever so good and be ever so lost. You can be ever so religious and be ever so lost. But thank God Cornelius knew that he needed somebody to tell him what to do. And so God honored his prayer. And when the angel which spake under Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. He got his staff together and he said, when he had declared all these things, under them, he sent them to Joppa. You remember with the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip in Acts chapter 8, an angel appeared to the, pre to the preacher who was Philip and said, I want you to go find that sinner who was the Ethiopian eunuch. Here, the angel appears to the sinner and says, go find a preacher. It doesn't matter which end it comes from. There needs to be somebody that knows the gospel, get together with somebody that doesn't know the gospel. And so the, the, the impact and the emphasis here is you got to go find somebody. You got to get together with somebody that knows the message. 
The work of the angel isn't to preach the gospel because angels can't preach the gospel. The work of the angel here in both cases is just to get the two parties together. The reason God's put you in somebody's sphere of existence is because you're the preacher. You say, I'm not a preacher. Oh, yes, you're a preacher. If you're a New Testament Christian, it's God's will for you to open your mouth and start where they are and preach to them Jesus. So you're in their circle for a reason. And angels aren't going to do it. First Peter. In fact, Peter would later write this. He would say, unto whom it was revealed, not unto themselves, but unto us, did the Old Testament writers minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Watch. Peter's writing these words later. Which things the angels desire to look into. There's no angel that can preach the gospel. The angels just desire to even look into the gospel. The angels are jealous of you sitting in the presence of God and being able as a lowly human being to be able to feel the Holy Ghost, but not only feel the Holy Ghost, the angels can sense the presence of God. They're in his presence continually, but you don't just feel the presence of God. That's the big lie in modern Christendom, that as long as you feel something, you're okay. I don't feel the presence of God. I'm filled with the presence of God. That's what the angels are jealous of. Cornelius is extremely religious and very, very good, but he isn't saved yet. He's ready to be saved, but he needs a preacher to tell him what to do. And that's why God's working both ends of the equation to bring them together. Verse 9, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew near to the city. Now here's God working on the other side. Somebody say, God work on me. See, God's working on the sinners that are in your sphere of influence, but if he can't work on you, we still lose. If he can't work on you, the gospel still doesn't get preached. If he can't shake you out of your lethargy and out of your tradition and out of the way it's always been, then we still lose. And that's what Peter needed. They draw near to the city. Peter, in the meantime, goes up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. This is about uh, j- just uh, around uh, noon in the, in the daytimes, high noon. He becomes very hungry. He would have eaten. And while they made ready, they're preparing him dinner, he fell into a trance. He sees a vision. He saw heaven open, a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been, great sheet knit at the four corners, let down to earth. And in that sheet, there's all manner of beasts and four-footed things and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And the word of God comes to him and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Well, Peter won't do that because Peter's a good Jew and the Jews have more laws about food than probably just about any other religion on the face of the earth. And Peter said, not so, Lord. I've read the Torah. There's clean animals and unclean, and those are all unclean. And I won't do that, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him the second time, what God has cleansed, thou, that call not thou common. Don't you call common, don't you call unclean what I'm working on. Don't you call dirty what I'm working on. Don't you turn your back on what I'm working on. This was done three times. The vessel was received up again into heaven, and Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. While he was doing that, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and right as Peter is getting, the, the, this vision has happened, and he's sitting there thinking, what in the world does that mean? Yeah, I'm hungry. I'm ready for lunch, but what does that mean? Is this vision really about lunch? What's it about? Don't call uh, unclean what I've called clean. What is that about? And just at that very moment, while he's thinking on the rooftop, these messengers from Cornelius arrive at his door, and they called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. See, God's timing's always perfect. These three men from Caesarea, which is a significant journey in that day, they arrive at the very moment Peter is thinking, what in the world is God trying to say? Could it be? That the reason you're in a series, uh, this particular lesson on the book of Acts, and the reason you have certain people who have said certain things, or they're at a certain place in their life, and they're in your circle of influence, is because God is trying to do for you what he did for Peter, and shake you a little bit out of your tradition, and out of your comfort zone, and out of your regular church routine. Because see, it isn't enough For God just to prepare the sinners, God has to prepare some preachers, not 
full-time paid professional expositors of the Word. God has to prepare some preachers, some witnesses, some evangelists. And if we aren't prepared for what God wants to do, we will miss the opportunity. And we are all preachers of the gospel. I don't have time, but 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible says in verse 6, God has also made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. You need to change gears on your witnessing. If all your witnessing is, is arguing scriptures with people and showing them that you've got higher, better, more in-depth Bible knowledge than them. That's not what people need to hear. People need to hear that Jesus changed your life, that Jesus can get in their problem and turn it around. People don't need to hear, and, and this, this is such a relief, because if you're not some big theologian who has 42 scriptures all perfectly committed to memory, and you can go through the Old Testament and show how it relates to the New and how this typology relates to that. And if you're just an ordinary Christian, congratulations. You're in the very place where God would like you to be because the letter all the time, that'll kill. But if you just get in their face and in their space and in their place and you're so full of Jesus that the joy bubbles over and you're so full of Jesus that the peace is constant in the middle of all your bad circumstances, something is going to connect. Why did the angel then, if everybody can do this, why did he instruct Cornelius to send for Peter? Well, we already talked about that. Philip's right there in the community. Peter's 30 miles away in Joppa. But it was Peter, not Philip, who'd been given the keys to the kingdom. And because this was a people group opening for the very first time in history, that's why Peter. It wasn't that Peter was the only preacher. It was that Peter had the keys. Now that the keys have gone into the lock and the Gentiles are coming into the kingdom all over the world, everybody is entitled to be a witness for God. Acts 1 verse 8 told us this. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you will be witnesses. Jerusalem, that's the Jews. Judea, Samaria. Judea is the Jewish province. Samaria is the Samaritans. And now, under the uttermost part of the earth. And the reason Peter is the guy that the angel calls is because Jesus said to Peter, Thou art Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So Peter, just like he did on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, just like they called him to Samaria in Acts 8, just like right now. He goes to the household of Cornelius on divine assignment, and he's not taking a different message configured for Gentiles. He's not taking a different message that's watered down. He's not taking a different message that's harder on Gentiles than it is on Jews. He's taking the very same message of Acts 2. We're almost finished this morning. Acts chapter two, 10, verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision. Here he goes. The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek thee. Get up, get down, go with them, doubting nothing. Everyone say, doubting nothing. Literally, in the Greek language, that means don't you make any distinction. Making no distinction. Doubting nothing. No doubtful disputations. No questions. You just go with them. You go with them as if they were Jewish. You go with them as if they were your best friend. You go with them as if they were in church last week beside you because I've got my hand on them. I have sent them. Peter went down to the men which were sent from him from Cornelius. said, Behold, I'm he whom you seek. What is the cause that why you've come? He said, they said, Cornelius the centurion, he's a just man. They start bragging on him. He's one that feareth God. He's of a good report among all the nation of the Jews. He's even been kind to the Jews, even though he's a Gentile. But he was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Cornelius is smart enough to realize that although he's a good man and he's a religious man and he treats God's people good and he's very kind and he does good deeds, he's smart enough to know. He's been impressed by this angel enough to know I've got to get to somebody that can tell me what 
to do. And Peter called them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them. And certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And it's a good thing that some of the Jewish Christians from Joppa accompanied him because if they hadn't, they would never have believed what God was about to do. After the morrow, they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius, he was waiting for them. But not just him. He'd called together all of his kinsmen. He'd called together all of his friends. He really wanted this to happen. He didn't just want it to happen for him. He wanted it to happen for all of his family. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and he fell down at his feet. He's so grateful. And he began to worship him, and Peter wasn't having any of that. He took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. Don't you worship me. This has nothing to do with me. This has nothing to do with how good I live. This has nothing to do with I'm more religious than you, or I go to church more than you. This only has to do with one thing. I've got Jesus in my life, and I'm here to share him with you. As he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together, and he said to them, you know, here's his disclaimer, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be in your circle. I'm not supposed to be among Gentiles. I'm not supposed to be in this house. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That's the meaning of the vision. Not about food. It's about people. There's nobody that's too far down, too far gone, too bad, too addicted for Jesus to not be able to get in their life and turn them around. So Peter said, nobody's common or unclean. And he said, I came to you without gainsaying. I didn't ask any questions as soon as I was sent for. And I asked, therefore, why did you send for me? And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, I'd been fasting all day. I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Your alms are had in remembrance of the sight of God. They weren't enough to save you, but God has heard your cry. They weren't enough to get you into heaven, but the good news is your noise, your prayer, your alms, your desperation, it was enough to get God's attention. And here's what God told me. Send to Joppa. Call Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodged in the house of the tanner by the seaside. And when he comes, he's going to speak to you. And so Cornelius says to Peter, immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Thanks for getting here quick. Now therefore, we're all present here before God. Watch, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. See, that's the New Testament pattern. Just because you're good doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you're a religious person doesn't mean you're saved. But if you can get your life into contact with somebody that knows how to be saved, how to get saved, that's where it all begins. Verse 34, Peter opened his mouth. Heard that before somewhere. Open your mouth and start where they are and preach to them Jesus. That's the New Testament pattern. He said, of a truth I perceive. God is no respecter of persons. He finally gets it. He preached this 10 years ago on the day of Pentecost. The promise is unto you and your children. He didn't even believe the next thing. He said, all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God anointed him to preach something he didn't yet believe. But 10 years later, it finally clicks. God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that fears God and works righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He's Lord of all. He's not just Lord of the Jews. He's not just Lord of the Pentecostals. He's not just Lord of the church members. He's Lord of all. That word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and he went about doing good and he went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. They crucified 
crucified him. But him, God raised up the third day and he showed him openly. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Uh, Paul said, we're the witnesses that he rose. We're the ones who saw him. I saw him on the Damascus road, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him, to Jesus, give all the prophets witness. Watch this. That through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Where have we heard that before? Only every time we hear about baptism in the book of Acts. It's remission of sins. Because when you're baptized, it's not just a religious ritual. It's for the remission of sins, and it's in his name. You know what's happening right here? Paul is just getting ready to share baptism with them. He's just getting ready to preach baptism to them. He's just getting ready to take a whole group of Cornelius' family down to the riverside and baptize them in Jesus' name. That's why he says, through his name, whoever believes in him can receive remission of sins. Paul's making his way through the gospel. Peter's making his way through the gospel, just like he did in Acts 2. He's preaching how Jesus died. He's preaching that so they'll repent. He's preaching how Jesus' name brings remission of sins when we're baptized. And he's, he's, he's ready to baptize him. And all of a sudden, something different happens. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell. The Holy Ghost fell fell on all them which heard the word. He wasn't expecting that. He's expecting to preach repentance, preach how Jesus died, preach how Jesus has now been raised, and everybody needs to ask him for forgiveness because you crucified him. Your sins took him to the tree. He's preached repentance. He was just getting ready to nail down baptism, but the Holy Ghost fell. These people were so hungry that the Holy Ghost fell even while he was preaching. God help us in the 21st century we could use a whole more, a whole lot more sermons and services and song services and prayer meetings and altar services where while we're sitting there listening, the Holy Ghost falls. Why did the Holy Ghost fall on Cornelius? Because they were so hungry. God said, wait just a minute, Peter. These people are hungry for the Holy Ghost now. They don't have time to wait to the end of your sermon. They're hungry for the Holy Ghost now. If you ever get hungry, enough for God. It doesn't matter whether you get to the end of service or not. I wish somebody would lift up your hands. Pastor's almost done, but I need you to interact with the Holy Ghost for a minute. That means with your voice. Jesus in your name. Jesus in your name. The Bible says they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. They weren't expecting this because that on Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They couldn't believe it. They weren't expecting. I don't know what they thought Peter was going to do. Maybe he was going to go and preach a message of judgment. Your life is so messed up. You're so addicted. You're so in sin. You don't have any good religious sense. You're not of our culture or our custom. I don't know what they thought Peter was going to preach under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But while Peter preached, there was such a hunger in the hearts of those people. They received the Holy Ghost. How did they know they had received the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. I am concluding, but if you are here and you think you've got the Holy Spirit in your life, but you've never spoken with tongues, I have uh, just a, an injunction for you. I have an exhortation for you. I'm not here to condemn you. Thank God that you've had the experience you've had. You have a Cornelius experience. You pray often. You love God. God. You do good things and God is working on your life. But the reason God is working on your life is so that you can come to that moment where it's not just the Holy Spirit around you. It's not just the Holy Spirit that you're feeling, but you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, you will speak with tongues. Something supernatural will happen in your life. They heard them speak with tongues. And you say, well, they, they received the Holy Ghost, so they must be done. 
No, Peter said, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost the same as we did? You still need to be baptized in Jesus' name even if you're spirit-filled, even if you speak in tongues. There's only one way to be baptized. It's everywhere in your Bible. Every believer in your Bible was filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. Every believer in your Bible was baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of their sins. That's why the Bible said, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So I'm just standing here in the stead of Peter. We couldn't get him here today. He's long been in the grave. We couldn't get Paul here today. He's long been in the grave. But the message hasn't changed. If you want God in your life, you still need to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, and you still need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I thank God for this day in church history. Because there wouldn't be, with all respect, I love all of our friends from all kinds of different denominations, but they wouldn't have let any Gentile believers in the church if it hadn't been for speaking in tongues, because until they heard them speak with tongues, they weren't going to let them in. But when God confirmed that he had his hand on the Gentiles, it was all over. What do we do? They received the Holy Ghost the same as we did. So there wouldn't be a Baptist church today if it hadn't been for speaking in tongues because there would be no Gentile Christians anywhere on any continent in any country if it hadn't been for speaking in tongues. There would be no Wesleyan church. There would be no Catholic church. There would be no Anglican church. There would be no Episcopal church. There would be no church of any kind. There would be no United Church. There would be no independent churches. There would be no Christian churches of any kind or any denomination if it hadn't been for this wonderful, glorious day when one one Gentile got hungry enough for God that God had to send a preacher to him unscheduled to preach to him the word of God. Would you lift up your hands in the presence of God? Pastor's done. But God would like to touch somebody's life here in the last few minutes of this service.